everybody. Welcome to the Digital Craft Festival uh, for another of the show and tell sessions with some amazing makers. Uh, you will be able to enjoy these at your leisure. Um, my name is Kate Strasden and I am a senior lecturer at Falmouth University in fashion and textile. So it's really amazing to see. Um, I see lots of printers and, and makers and textile designers at work, but um, I'm really excited to chat with some great makers today. We've got uh, Sarah Williams, who's a leather worker. We have um, Ben Partridge, who's going to be uh, showing us through his um, print and design. Jess Laird, who's a leather worker, and Katie Davis with her knitwear. So I'm um, going to start, Sarah, with you. Could you just talk to us a little bit about how you came to enter the exciting world of, of leather making, or leather working, rather? Um, so when I was like, finishing school and my A-levels, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, um, but I always enjoyed like creative things. So I went and did a degree in design crafts at Hereford Art College, which was local to me. Um, and after my degree, I did start doing leather work and making bags on that. Um, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing because it wasn't specific to leather work. So I hadn't learned all of the skills that I needed. Um, so I went and did a master's at London College of Fashion because um, they've got a specialist leather college um, and then after that I got a job as a product developer in a leather goods factory so I worked there for five years so I really learned a lot there because I was basically just given a drawing of something and said go away and figure out how to make this um, so I really enjoyed that but after after a while I felt I wasn't getting to be that creative because it was other people's designs and not mine. So I started up my own business. Um, and to begin with, it was part time and my job let me cut down my hours. And then unfortunately, the, the company closed down. So I was pushed into the world of doing it full time. Um, and I've been doing it 10 years now. Amazing. No, it's really, I think um, one of the things I've really enjoyed about doing these is, is hearing people's journey through uh, what, you know, every, because each one is so different and um, it's really brilliant to, and it's never straightforward, is it? It's never, there's never, you kind of, you kind of graduate from art school and then do the thing that you, it doesn't, it, it rarely happens like that. So I think um, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, ben, how about you? Um, so I think, Probably a lot like Sarah, um, I kind of left uh, sort of school, went to university and didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I think that's probably the, the same for most people when they, they head to university, they kind of just pick something that they're interested in and, and uh, sort of don't really know what they're going to do after that. Um, and always through school, I think I had some misplaced creativity. Um, so I was always a musician through school um, and actually probably wasn't that good at it to be honest um and I think I probably should have gone into more of a visual medium um a little bit earlier um so I think it was some of that creativity was a little bit misplaced but um out of pure fear uh, leaving sixth form going into university um I kind of just went very much away from anything sort of creative so I actually went and did a psychology degree um and it was only many years later that I sort of found that I actually quite enjoyed um, sort of dipping my toe back into something a little bit more creative. Um, so I went and did a psychology degree. Again, had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do at the end of it. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just do a master's. I'll stay on. Um, so I did that out of, again, sort of just grappling really for something that sort of uh, interested me. Um, and eventually fell into a teaching post. Um, and it very much was <laughs> falling into it. Not, nothing was really ever planned out. Um, and for quite a number of years, I taught as um, a special educational needs teacher. Um, and halfway through that, um, really sort of discovered print. I really discovered surface pattern design. Um, so I've never really been taught as such. Um, and a little part of me always kind of thinks that, uh, you know, there's that little imposter syndrome that creeps in with everybody. But I think that's where, where mine really comes from. Um, so I'm always, I've always been sort of self-taught to a degree um, and started my business while I was working full time as a teacher, which was quite challenging. Um, but after a year or two, um, I had struck quite a nice uh, part-time balance. So 
part-time with my business, part-time as a teacher. Um, and then like any good teacher after about sort of eight or nine years thought I really can't do this anymore. Um, and now I still have a part-time sort of half and half, uh, but I went back to university a couple of years ago. Um, so I've still got that balance between what I do creatively and that sort of love and interest uh, in psychology. So I'm now two thirds of the way through a PhD in psychology while I also run my business, which is not a sensible idea for anyone thinking about doing that. <laughs> that is, I mean, I, I hear you. I did my PhD when I was pregnant with my um, second son and it's just, yeah, mental. But, you know, <laughs> if you want a job done, ask a be person. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. So thanks. I love, I, I like, I like how all these stories evolve. So brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, Jess, how about you? Um, well, my mum was a saddler, so growing up, I was sort of around leather, leather work all the time, but never really took much notice because that's what teenagers do, just ignore their parents completely. And so I picked up a few, uh, a few tricks of the trade and a few skills and techniques. And I spent a lot of my time threading needles for her and doing, doing skivvy jobs. And then, uh, yeah, as I said, completely ignored it and became a teacher like Ben and uh, taught primary for 10 years before having um, my first child and then tried to do teaching after having the first child and it just I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't cope with, her, with the, the juggle so sort of had a little, little break for a while um, and then after when I had my last baby um, was sort of thinking about going back into teaching couldn't really work out how to play it and while, while doing that my mum was retiring so selling off all her tools and things and so I kept saying to her oh don't you know don't set up you know I'll just take it home and play with it for a while and every time I went to see her I came back with another tool and then spent my evenings pottering around at home uh sort of re, re remembering I suppose what, what I'd known as a teenager and then on a couple of courses but most of it's just self-taught and then tapping my mum my mum's information and um yeah about three years now doing it part-time and just starting to turn it into a full-time job. Amazing, amazing. I think, you know, sometimes there's a perception that um, that you kind of know that, that crafters or makers go to, go to college, they go to art college, they learn their craft and then they you know step into a career either you, and, and it's and it's rarely the case and I think with with so many people that I've spoken to that's a, a very natural path isn't it that you end up in lots of different you've either got a portfolio career whilst you're which means you, you have different things going on at the same time or or you come to it after a variety of other things so amazing thanks Jeff um and Katie how about you uh, so I finished in school and went on to do a foundation course in art and design so it was there that I kind of discovered um, textiles and quite sort of 3D um, creating. Um, really went, enjoyed and kind of thought I'm going to go into textile. So I did my degree in contemporary textiles uh, in uh, Carmarthen, which is in West Wales. So they've got a, a brilliant art college there and they were so on the textiles course we sort of were involved in different processes of textiles so weaving knitting printing um stitching so in my final year i decided to specialize in knitwear and from there i finished my degree and went away traveling for a little while only about six months so that was amazing, really good to kind of go and let loose and enjoy and see the world. Uh, came back and started doing lots of work experience in, in various companies. So I got a job at, uh, it's a local knitwear factory in a place called Armonford, uh, which is sort of southwest Wales. And... I worked there um, full time initially as a product developer, um, designer slash, yeah, it was kind of lots of roles within one and kind of increased my role there to go on to um, 
sort of managing part of the, the knitwear section. So they they make knitwear and socks. Uh, so it's quite a high end um, sort of style that they create for different designers as well as their own range. So similar sort of story to Sarah, I began to kind of reduce my hours slightly because I'd started on my own collection. So just started part time and kind of realised how, yeah, it's, it's juggling, a balance of juggling, trying to run a business as well as kind of working and obviously learning. I learned so much there and I worked there for about seven and a half years. So until very recently, I've actually just decided to kind of go full time with my business. Um, just felt I was at a stage where I needed um, a slight sort of change of direction and I, I just wanted a bit of a change. So I've, I've decided to go into the, the world full time and yeah, just go ahead with my business and creating my knit when we'll see, see how things go from here on. Amazing. It's true, isn't it? I mean, I think um, the theme, I mean, the theme that we're going to explore in today's show and tell is this idea of process and some of the, because when, I think when visitors come to the craft festival, it's seeing the, if they watch workshops or it's seeing the kinds of processes that make what you do unique and what make what you do special, why you don't go to the high street and buy something um, you know cheaper chips when when they can invest in something unique and each of you have also I think what's turning into um, part of the story of this as well is that um, that you can come to these things at whenever you know that it doesn't there isn't necessarily um, a clear-cut path and that and that being a maker is um, a choice that you can make at different times um, fantastic so we are going to talk a bit about process because it's about how how you invest in in artisanal practices and i know for myself when i when i watch makers it's about understanding some of the, the processes that that your audience might not necessarily uh know anything about so sarah can i come back to you and and have a chat about what um a process or a part of your practice that that you really enjoy or something that's special to you so I'm going to show you how to um, cut a strap and how to finish the edges. Um, I also teach workshops and this is something when I teach a workshop, everyone is kind of like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that that was possible. Uh, so that's why I've chosen it. Um, so this is a strap cutting tool and inside of here is a really sharp blade. And you might be able to see there's like measurements on here. So we can adjust this. So we're cutting the width of the strap that we need. Um, just move this. So over here, I've got um, a nice thick piece of leather. So for this could be for a belt or for a bag strap. Um, the leather would need to be like nice and thick. So this is about three mil thick and it's all vegetable tan leather. You need to have a straight edge to start with. So that edge would have been cut with a ruler and a knife. Um, and then the leather, the end of the leather is just gonna go in this gap here. So it goes in here. And we just keep this edge of the tool flat against the edge of the leather and pull. And then, like magic, we have a strap. And then, wow, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's really clever. And people are always like, oh, I don't think I'll be able to do it. And then when they do it, they're like, actually, it's, it's easy. <laughs> um, and then there's a couple of ways that you can finish the edges of the strap. Um, because if you see now, it's, it's given a nice sharp edge. So you can leave it like this, or there's other options. 
So I'll just tilt this down. And we can use this tool, which is an edge crease. And you just put one side against the edge of the lever and the other side on top of the lever and you push it away from you. And it gives a nice decorative edge. And then there's another tool, which is called an edge beveler. And this one has got a little groove in there and you put it at a 45 degree angle on the edge of the lever and you push it away from you. And what that does is it just takes the sharp corner off the edge of the lever. So now it's more of a rounded edge. Um, but now you'll see this edge doesn't look very finished. So what we can do is burnish the edge now. So we use this um, gum. And it's like a completely natural product. So you can just dip your finger in it. It's not going to hurt you. You put it on the edge of the lever. So it's nice and wet. And then we use a cloth and you just rub this. And just like magic, the edge then becomes a nice shiny sealed edge. So that's wow. just like protecting it so no water can get there and your strap or your belt is gonna last a lot longer. That's, that's fantastic. I really, I mean, apart from, this is what, this is what people are buying, isn't it? When you, when you meet these kind of businesses and that you, it's about personality. It's about building that connection with a maker, but seeing the, the time, it, it's not just about the skills you've learned. It's the time it takes to actually um, create that thing. Uh, the tools. Yeah, because the, that, that burnishing, like that bit took a couple of seconds, but to do a whole, belt is going to take a really long time exactly that and that's the that's the beauty of it isn't it you really it's the uniqueness of it but then that 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 hand the actual investment with the hands the working with the hands um yeah that's fantastic thank you so much sarah um ben so so you said about kind of discovering that creative side um after you'd done your initial bit of studying so what what do you most love about, what's the kind of process that you most love about your uh, print and, and surface decoration? So I think the thing that I get asked, not actually that often, but occasionally is where I buy my fabrics from. And I think sometimes people don't realize that that is possibly the biggest part of what I do is in designing that. Um, so it's not something that they can go and buy, you know, from like an online seller somewhere I've just sourced it um, I think sometimes people don't realize that um, yes I have a hand in making quite a bit of what I produce some of it I use like small scale manufacturing for um, but actually the biggest part of what I do through the early part of the year through January February March is actually developing um, a base of prints and then designing uh, and building surface pattern designs based on sort of my original print work so it's the print process I think is probably the most important thing. Now a lot of the earlier work that I produced use a small scale lino cuts so this is um, just a very simple lino cut from a, a really early design which I do still produce um, and what I tend to do is take the original print whether that's a lino cut or a screen print which I'll show you in a sec as well um, and then develop that into a repeat design uh, and more recently, the design work that I'm doing is um, much more complex than some of my earlier design work was. Um, so this is the surface design that is based on this original small scale lino cut. So I actually have a digital process between creating an original print and producing the textile. Uh, there's a digital process involved and a printers that I used to print that. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why I do that. So um, the print process is really eco-friendly so I could hand block print and or I could hand screen print but I'm really kind of eco-conscious with what I try and produce uh, and there's all, all, always an awful lot of waste and sometimes the inks and things that you, you can use can be quite toxic um, so having that digital process really helps me reduce um, 
the amount of potential waste um, and helps me also keep my process quite eco-friendly. Um, also, I produce quite a lot. Um, so, I, I mean, I, you, I know you can see behind me, you should, you should see my stock shelves. I, I do produce a lot in a year. And if I was hand printing everything, the price would go up quite significantly, but also I just wouldn't be able to produce the sort of volumes that I need to produce. Um, so I can also produce quite a large volume using that digital process. Uh, but like I say, there is that original sort of hand printed um, product at the beginning. Um, and most of what I'm producing at the minute is produced using um, screens. Uh, so using a screen print process rather than a lino cut process, because what I've found is um, I can produce much more colourful, complex designs um, using a screen print. So this is, um, for most, some people may know uh, what a screen is, but um, it used to be made out of silk, now it's not silk, uh, but it's stretched across an aluminium or wooden frame. And um, I have a design which I always use a dip pen and acetate and hand draw. Uh, then the screen is coated with this dark brown. So this is a light sensitive emulsion. Um, and everything that you can see in the lighter sort of yellow color is where the light sensitive emulsion hasn't hardened through um, exposing it using a really high wattage bulb. Um, and you can wash this out and then the ink is pulled across the screen using a squeegee, which is like a flat rubber tool. Um, and what you'll end up with is, when you layer each colour down one by one. So this is the print from that particular screen of a house sparrow. And then I'll start to play around with how this goes together. Um, and I'll start to come up with sort of textiles. This is a new textile that hopefully will be arriving next week from the printers. Um, I can start to make uh, more complex surface designs than um, I previously used to make. That's gorgeous. Cool. There's two things two amazing things that, that come out there that make me think first of all it's that um the small scale production i mean if we are learning anything through this current pandemic it's that people are realizing that supply chains are being disrupted and we need to think about the things that we want to buy that are that are local that are you know uk based that invest in um kind of manufacturing and and processes in this country and that's really i think that's going to be something that comes out of this so that's a really important point but also that that kind of marrying the hand and the digital is is really exciting as well because it's um sometimes i think i mean i know when we when we talk to katie in a minute about um, when you're using machines, it's it's really they are your tools, aren't they? So it's that that creative process is still a massive part of how you how you make. And then the the digital part of it is becoming your is is your tool in the same way that Sarah is using her um, the kind of bevel for making her edges. You your tool is is that. And it's interesting because I think they're two really dirty words in what we do, manufacturing and uh, digital. Um, and I've heard at some of the events that I've done, not, I'm not gonna mention any names, uh, but some people sort of going, oh, digital, oh. Um, but I think there's a lot of benefits to it. There's a lot of benefits for me. I mean, like I say, I don't do what I do full time. Um, that is ultimately the aim, um, but I do have to juggle those two things. And I think the only way I can continue to do what I do and produce the volume of work that I produce, that I need to produce, is to engage in that digital process. And I don't think it should be a dirty word. Um, and also I don't think manufacturing should be a dirty word as well because it's, I mean, I'd love to produce everything that I produce for me in my studio and sell it on to somebody else. Um, but A, it's just not possible. And sometimes you, I kind of go, I know that if I produce this myself, I'm not going to be able to sell it. It's just going to be too expensive. Um, and also, like you say, in a supply chain, it's not just me. When somebody buys from me, it's not just me that they're supporting. It's a whole industry. Um, and I use like three or four different manufacturers and I buy materials from like three or four different people. So immediately there's like eight, nine, 10 people that you're also supporting when you buy something from me as well. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a really important point. And I think you're quite right. You know, the idea of, of digital is a, is a, um, because you're incorporating it into your craft and like you say, reducing toxicity and in, in other things that you might be using, then it, it, it's feeding into that sustainability as well. So um, yeah, amazing, thank you. Um, so Jess, you've got your, your bags looking fabulous behind you. So, so tell us something about a, a process that you really enjoy. 
And I was going to talk to you about, a little bit about hand stitching um, leather goods. So I don't have any machines um, here. It's just just me and my hands, um, but, which is which is lovely and very meditative. Quite slow, but it is very enjoyable. Um, so I thought I'd talk talk to you a little bit about um, the little bit about his, the history of um, saddle stitching, which is what most of my um, stitching would be. Um, so. In the in the olden days, um, they would have used it mostly for equestrian goods, and that needed to be very very strong and durable to make sure that it could hold the heavy loads, things like the horse harnesses and the saddles and things. You, if, if one stitch broke, you wouldn't want to have a disaster. So, they needed to find a way to make um, yeah really strong durable stitch to hold to hold all eventualities. So. Um, Traditional um, leather work saddle stitch would be done um, with one wax linen thread with a needle at either end and um, what happens within each stitch you do is the needles pass through each other within the hole in the leather and they make a sort of form a little knot each time you stitch. So um, if one stitch breaks or if something wears away the whole row wouldn't go, um, it, would, it, would ho it would hold strong. Um, so what we do um, for saddle stitch, generally I make a line, um, a, a sort of trace line in the leather and then I would use a pricking iron, these are very old ones, these are my mum's from, from um, years ago, but so pr the pricking irons come in all different shapes and sizes and this, this one would produce 10 stitches per inch and this one would produce 5 stitches per inch, it just depends on what kind of um, item you're making. Um, so usually I'm using about an eight um, stitches per inch pricking iron and I would make the marks in the leather, it wouldn't pierce all the way through. And then as I'm stitching, I use an awl. So this is a diamond awl, which is used by um, lots of leather workers, um, which makes a hole in the leather. So for each hole, each time you're making a stitch, you make a hole through the leather, you get your needles, one at either end, and you just simply pass them through the leather so they pass in, in the middle and then pull them nice and, nice and so you've got good tension. And eventually you should get a nice line of, um, of stitching. So they go and you can generally tell if something's hand stitched. There's, um, you can see a slight um, angle to the stitches and um, it just, you can, it's quite a big difference between machine stitching and hand stitching. You can usually tell. Um, and so I wax my threads using um, a nice bit of beeswax and that usually that tends to protect the um, thread from um, well it slightly waterproofs it and it also sort of bonds it in, in, in each hole so, so that um, it provides a little bit more stick um, and yeah that's about it so you could um, if I was doing a say a strap or a belt I would it would be a day's worth of work if you were hand stitching all the way along and it uh, you'd end up quite cross-eyed by the end but it is very nice sitting here in the workshop hiding away and stitching away. But it's really lovely I think what's interesting with the leather worker I was thinking this when Sarah was um, demonstrating hers as well is that with yours there's that real connection with uh, with history isn't it in that you're all using the same kinds of tools things like the awl and the, you know, that leather workers have used for generations and generations and that it's, there's that, that real continuity of, of a craft and a skill there. I had no idea about the double, like the double-ended, um, having needles at either end and the, and the way that that works. So yeah, I love, I love in that context how, how you must feel that you've got continuity with, with makers past. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, it's, yes, it's lovely. And, and knowing that, yeah, that skill would have been passed down from generation to generation. Um, you know, I make bags, but it would have been used for all sorts of, all sorts of things. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's really, really nice feeling. And you do feel a connection with each, with each product because you're spending so much time with each one. <laughs> by, the time you, by the time they end up leaving you, it's, yeah, you feel like, feel like you're giving a friend away. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, and finally, moving on, um, Katie, you've got your gorgeous range of like rainbow of lovely knit there. Um, so tell us about so tell us about some process that goes into what you do. 
So there's quite a variation of processes from the beginning of the creating of the, the, the item um, to the finish. Um, one of the processes I really enjoy is this sort of design part of it, um, which is kind of centrally um, revolved around pattern creating and creating a, a repeat pattern that uh, is essentially is knitted on, on the machine. So I use, um, this is called a punch card. So each tiny um, hole is individually punched using a hole punch tool. So it's basically a 24 needle repeat. So whatever um, finishes at this side, will then start again over the other side. So it's basically repeated across the bed of knitting. So even though this is only 24 needles, normally I would knit with probably about 200 needles. So it will actually repeat across every 24 to create then a, a repeat in the fabric. So that's definitely part of something I really enjoy sketching out. And it's all about kind of scale and, depending on what kind of size of pattern you want, it could fill the, the card or it would be kind of a smaller area pattern. So once that's done, it's over to the machine. So this is my knitting machine, I'll just move you closer. So I've had this for, oh, about three years now. Um, Previously, I had a similar model. So this is a brother knitting machine. So it's a, quite an old machine which has been refurbished. So one of the techniques I really enjoy is to create a uh, rib stitch, which I use on the bottom of my hats. So it's quite a nice um, stitch because it gives quite a clean sort of finish. And yeah, it, it basically gives a nice elasticated um quality to the fabric which will enable you to obviously stretch it on and off so one of the techniques is actually transferring stitches from the bottom of the knitting bed up to the top so when you're creating a rib you've got two beds of uh, stitches so basically i will take one stitch at the bottom here using a trans double ended transfer tool I then transfer the tool to the top and this then uh, transfers the stitch up to the top bed. So I've just put an example here of a few, um, there's about 20 stitches here. So each one is picked up and moved onto the top bed. So when I'm making a hat, uh, it's usually about 170 needles, so it's full width of the bed, uh, which sometimes the knitting machine is quite noisy, um, so it can be quite loud, but this is a part of the process which there's no sound because you're not using the carriage. So it's quite therapeutic for me. <laughs> um, some people would find it a bit monotonous, but once you get into a rhythm, you yeah you kind of get get things done quicker so I've transferred all of the stitches to the top so I'm now just working on this top bed so just going to drop the bottom beds down and this is then my carriage so I'll connect my yarn feeders which are just at the top here so it's the way that the yarn is all connected through to give tension um, obviously you can play around with lots of colours and sort of combinations. It's only two colours you can knit at a time, but uh, you can kind of stripe within this or create lots of textures with it as well. So I'm just going to show you that I quickly would just knit one row of stitches. Then I have my punch card in the machine just over here, which I showed you earlier. So I'm now going to select the pattern. So it's a couple of um, sort of buttons and things on the carriage here, which you, you'd select. And then basically you can insert your second color. So this will go in 
to this feeder B, which you've got two feeders. And from there, I can start knitting. So as you can hear, it can be quite noisy. <laughs> but once I've got my headphones on, I'm away to go. So the once basically you've done a part of a fabric, um, all of the items are then washed to it, it removes the natural oils from the yarn. So a cone of yarn is just like this. I've got lots behind me on the shelf here. Um, this is all dyed and spun in the UK. So I've got a supplier that I can choose lots of colours from, um, depending on, mainly I use a lamb's wool yarn. Sometimes I'll combine cotton and bamboo. So each item is then washed and finished um, using, you, you have to sort of hand sew certain areas together and the washing process gives it a nice soft finish. So that's kind of a final washed piece and um, the steam press then to, to, yeah, to just give it that final touch really. So yeah, and there's, there's quite a few pieces here. Um, so I create sort of smaller items from hats and uh, purses up to garments, so sort of jumpers and ponchos and scarves and things. Amazing, amazing. And I think, again, this is, it's really important. I think sometimes the idea of a machine is that you're just pressing a button and, and you know, that's it. You just walk away and, and that. But there's so much of your time and energy invested in things like the, um, the punch cards and how you, and also with all of you, we pay for your thinking time, don't we? And your design and your creativity. That's so much an important part of what you do as makers apart from what you're doing with your hands as well it's the it's the um that ability to turn what's going on here into something as lovely as all of that um thank you so much so i just wanted to finish with um talking to each of you about how you found this bizarre time obviously the fact that we're all watching this from our sofas um how have you, so Sarah, how have you found it? Have you been able to kind of carry on working as before? Is it, has it been okay? Uh, well, I actually moved workshop and house in like the first week of lockdown. So that was a bit, uh, that was an experience. <laughs> um, but apart from that, like I work on myself, um, by myself all the time anyway. So all my friends have been telling me how it's really strange like working from home but working from home is like a normal thing for me um so i haven't really found any difference in that um and thankfully after like a couple of weeks sales went back to normal um i think a lot of people are shopping online um so in a way that's probably helped a bit um, I teach workshops as well, so I haven't been able to teach any workshops. So that that's a bit different because that was my one interaction with other human beings, like each week. Um, so I look forward to being able to do that again. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think the the kind of uh, lone makers are are winners in this in this particular kind of situation, isn't it? If you are used to working at home and and um in that respect it's it's a real positive are you how are you finding it ben is that is that a similar kind of scenario for you yeah i would say it probably is quite similar actually it's been a bit of a bizarre time like it's just been a bit tricky just to kind of make it through but um if anything i've had more time than i would have in the studio before um and actually i this i always call this my safe space so it's always where i come to when um i just kind of want to get away from everyone else um because i am on my own um so i have probably produced more than i normally would um i've definitely sold more than i normally would um online um the downside being obviously all the events have been cancelled stockists have closed so it, it's probably sort of leveled out for me over the past couple of months, which has been really good. Um, and to have that like support from people online is, is really, really valuable. Um, the one thing that I have been able to do 
which I never ever get time to do is catch up on stuff that I started last August, which was still hanging around the studio. So I spent like the first uh, probably like four, five, six weeks finishing stuff that that would have been hanging around for another six months probably as well. So it's been quite nice to do. Yeah, yeah. If we're looking at positives through all of this, that um, that enforced uh, at homeness which has you know been hard for people in lots of ways but actually uh, it, a chance just to reset slightly is is one of the um yeah we can take that as a positive can't we um how about you jess has it been has it been okay as far as the making is concerned and and how things are going um i've had very little time to be honest to i sneak out here in the evenings but the days with children is just um full on so i've had i've got much less done than i usually would do um i have it's been fairly quiet i've had sort of a constant trickle of orders um which is, is lucky to be honest because i wouldn't be able to fill, fill them otherwise but um i definitely have been using this as a yeah so getting away from everybody else space and uh it because again because i work on my own this is the normal bit so i sort of capitalizing on that when i can so yeah, yeah no, that's been... that's um are you having to are you having to wade through the the um particular horrors of homeschooling i am yes <laughs> yeah and even though i was a teacher it's not the same with, <laughs> with your own no it's a unique kind of um agony isn't it <laughs> <laughs> Pain, i'm but... sure there are some people that are really loving it but yeah not me <laughs> <laughs> oh and how about you katie are you are you kind of so obviously you've got your machine there at you're at home how how's it been yeah not not too bad so i'm based here at home so i've got a studio here and like sarah said it's kind of being at home and working here is is part of what we all do as as makers i guess um as i said recently i have gone from working part-time to doing this full time so i guess that's slowly been a process of getting used to being at home uh you know all the, all day all week and yeah but i guess orders have been been good online and for me sometimes a lot of my work is seasonal because i use a lot of wool but i have kind of had a bit more of a chance to develop some sort of summer pieces and using a bit more cotton so i feel like i've had a bit more time to kind of create rather than just sort of knitting you know constantly kind of trying to get through orders so it's been it's been nice to, to kind of get the orders done and, and they're coming in which is amazing and as well as having a bit of creative time you know to to be able to come up with some new new pieces to to sustain the business throughout the year rather than just kind of more seasonal and yeah i guess it's quite up and down for, for everyone some days i think oh i don't you know i don't know what to do today i don't know which where to start should i do this shall i do this but yeah it's just kind of going through the process and, and doing what you can and yeah amazing i th i mean i think it's such a it's a joy it's such a lovely community of makers and hearing everyone's stories and processes uh, is is it's a great opportunity so even though we're not doing this in real life at craft festival where you can see but actually there's um there's real value in here being able to have such great chats with everyone so thank you so much for joining me today i hope you've enjoyed all of all of your all of the information about everybody that you've seen here is available on the um digital craft festival website and all the things like Instagram things and you'll be able to look up. So thanks you so much for joining me and um, enjoy. <laughs>